Welcome to Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos and I am your host. The inspiration for this series is to show the amazing lives people live. The key word here is live. I hope to capture through interviewing many wonderful Vermonters and even a few people outside Vermont, some stories of their lives and experiences to our audience while they are still very much alive. Over the years, I have read too many obituaries that left me pondering, why did I not have a chance to meet this person while they were alive? The goal of this program is to celebrate the lives of everyday Vermonters while they are still with us. Some people will be recognized by many viewers and lots of the people I plan to interview will be known by only a few close intimate group of friends and family. I will guarantee that all the people who are interviewed will have fascinating stories to share with you. You see, I am of the notion that everyone has a story to tell. If you would like to be interviewed or know someone who you think would be like, would like to be interviewed, please contact the CC TV channel coordinator, Jordan Butterfield. This information will be posted at the end of the show. Also, if you find yourself wanting to follow up on this interview and have a question for the interviewee, you can write the CCTV channel coordinator with your question and he will reach out to the interviewee for a response. Make sure you also leave your contact information, telephone and email address. Thank you. Now, I would like to introduce you to Eddie Baker. I know Eddie as a, uh, a man of many talents and qualities. He runs the Addiction Recovery Channel on this same station. He's got a master's in social work. He's been a therapist for years in long-term recovery, strong advocate for stigma busting, um, cares deeply about his fellow human being, um, concerned about racial justice and change for, for good. So. Welcome, Eddie. Glad to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. I'm just so excited uh, to be here. I just loved your introduction. What a, a great concept to celebrate life and have people on your show that can share their lives and, you know, you know, be examples for others uh, to, especially in this time where you know, we're all a little bit, not a little bit, we're all very, you know, beleaguered as uh, putting it mildly. So focusing on celebrating life, I think is a great idea. I want to congratulate you, Gary, from the bottom of my heart. And I want to also thank you from the same place for honoring me and asking me, you know, to be the guest on your 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 maiden voyage, your inaugural <laughs> show. Um, well, thank, thank you. you. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I look forward to this time together uh, for this interview. Now, all those things that I mentioned about you um, don't happen overnight. So if you would, take us back to Eddie Baker as a young boy and some of the foundational things that shaped your life to make you who you are today. Yeah, sure. I'll be, I'll be happy to. And um, I mean, of, I, I was born in 1946, a long time ago. In, in the Bronx, uh, New York. Uh, my, I'm, I have the same name as my, my father. My father's name is Edwin Baker. Uh, my father was a, um, a beautiful, simple, um, hardworking, honest man. He was a, a cab driver uh, for many years. Um, he was good to me. We did many things together. He was a, an avid kite flyer. He was a tail man. He mm. would always focus on the tail was the most important part <laughs> of the kite. He would get in trouble with my mom because he would use, you know, material from the house to make tails for kites. Right. I can remember once at Ferry Point Park in the Bronx, it was, um, it was by one of the bridges, the bridge that went over to Queens from the Bronx, where it was, it was very windy there all the time. And that's where we would go to mm. fly. And um, we had, our cord was very, very long. You could hardly see our kite. That's how high it was. He was a wow. great kite flyer. And wow. I can remember once where he had me holding the cord and, and that, that tension between the force of that kite moving with the wind <laughs> and you holding it down was just a little scary. But <laughs> the fact that he uh, trusted me 
uh, and and felt that I could do that was uh, a beautiful, a beautiful yeah. memory. And that he, mom, took, but, that he took the time to be with you and do things like that. That sounds like a oh, wonderful father-son yeah. type of thing. Oh, we collected coins, Gary. Back in those days, in like the 50s, mm -hmm. when we collected coins, you could go to the bank and get a couple of rolls of pennies or a couple of rolls of nickels or dimes and sift through them and find really collectible coins yeah. because they were still in circulation. Yeah. You know, we had a great coin collection. We had wow. pennies, Indian head pennies, buffalo nickels, um, what the mercury dimes, liberty quarters. We had a great coin collection. Mm. Um, you know, that's one of my fondest uh, memories of him. He came to all my baseball games. He was a mm. wonderful, wonderful man. Mm. Um, my mom, uh, Agnes, my mom was uh, uh, an orphan. And um, back then in the, in the early 1900s, yeah. you know, yeah. we, we didn't have child care laws. We didn't have child welfare laws the way we do today. Right. She was brought up in, in an orphanage. And um, yeah. my mom uh, always uh, had a, a penchant and affinity for, for people who had less. Mm. For people who longed to be understood and longed to be loved and had less, she always had a, a big open heart because of her experience. My mom and my dad met dancing at Roseland. Okay. Um, they, became, they were really, really good, uh, good dancers. And um, so to answer your question, I mean, my my I had four siblings. My my oldest brother Bobby was twenty years my senior. My sister uh, Barbara was right behind him. My sister Billy is ten years my senior. I was very much the um, a baby of the family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, I can just say that we we had we never had money. Um, my my dad, you know, he didn't make a lot of money, but but we always had love. Uh, yes. we, we always had a lot of good food. My mother was an Italian. She loved to cook Italian, and um, she loved to have people over for food. Hmm. Um, where where is that? We, we, were, we were taught we were taught to be good. Yeah. I was a good boy. I, I went to Catholic school. I did baptism, communion, confirmation. I was just good. Mm -hmm. I was a, a, good, a good kid. We had a normal family, and I was a good kid. So that part of you that uh, is very passionate about helping others in your life. Yeah. Um, it's, I can hear it coming through your mother and your father and that yeah. foundation of love that you had. Yeah, yeah. You know, my mother was, um, she was very big in the 60s. She was big into civil rights. Um, she was, uh, uh, I think, one of the uh, initial people who was involved in orphans' rights mm. during the 60s. There was a movement. And I don't oh. think they got really far either. But she was involved in orphans' rights also. Um, we we were taught to to love people when and we lived in a, you know we didn't eradicate uh, white supremacy, you know. But 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 we knew how to love people, and um, when when uh, <clears throat> we lived in an Italian neighborhood in the Bronx, mm -hmm. and a white Italian neighborhood in the Bronx, and every once in a while, um, someone of color, either a black person, a black family, or a a Hispanic Puerto Rican family would move into the neighborhood and they would get shunned by people. Mm. They would mm. get shunned by people. This is no joke, but not by, not by my family. Mm -hmm. No, we, we were taught to reach out and that's what we did. The sixties wow. were, were very difficult. Uh, I saw busing yeah. happen. Um, racism was uh, like violent racism was alive and well in, in the Bronx in the sixties. And we weren't a part of that. We stood up. We just, we stood up to that. Good for you. Good for your family. Yeah. Do you have uh, childhood heroes, Eddie, outside the family? <laughs> no. Uh, you know, to want me to be honest with you. <clears throat> That's like a little. It's a little embarrassing. Oh. I liked. I liked superheroes. I like. I my. I would always. I would have superhero. Uh, um comic books mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. superman now superman on tv 
Yeah. You know, the whole Superman series. Oh yeah. I would I would actually stand at attention in the Superman pose when they went through the truth, justice in the American way part. Yep. I really that that resonated. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It really That's truth, great. justice in the American way. Uh, wow. It still resonates with me, and it resonated me very, very deeply as a little boy. <clears throat> hmm. okay. Yeah. Did you, any dreams of what you wanted to be when you grew up? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's an interesting uh, question. I think about that sometimes now when I when I meditate because I um I did I was a, a Christian boy, and um I I do believe that. Uh, I just wanted to do good, you know? So the something having to do with the Christian faith mm -hmm. was not out of the ballpark. Also, um, police work, um, protecting and serving, protecting mm -hmm. and serving was mm -hmm. definitely uh, a little closer maybe to, uh, to something that I had an aspiration toward. Yeah. Uh, just doing good, doing yeah. good. It was all about doing good. <clears throat> yep, yep. So then you started growing up, you went to high school, you eventually to college, it sounds like. Well, and well, with my life, Gary, you know, my, my life is, you know, what happened in my life, um, we, we, we would call it today uh, an early adverse experience or adverse childhood experience, uh, a toxic experience that, that actually changed uh, my brain mm. and um and really kind of set me off on a, a self-destructive tangent for many years mm -hmm. my my lovely father um suddenly died uh when i was 13 years old mm. and um this was a uh, my entire family was devastated yep. and god yep. bless them you know they didn't know what to do with me I was just 13. That's a very fragile they age. Know, they didn't know how to talk to me. Uh, they, were, they didn't know about counseling. So as we, you know, read adverse childhood experience theory today, you know, yep. there's toxic stress that overwhelms the child yep. and there's no uh, adult to help them mediate that. Well, that was what happened to me. Okay. And um, as a result, I began, you know, really hitting the streets, basically. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And, um, you know, discovering drugs, alcohol, yep. nicotine, marijuana, stimulants, opioids, you know, all the drugs. Yep. And um, I do, I'm one of those people where you hear about addiction has genetic uh, risk factors and mm -hmm. then environmental factors. Yep. Well, I had no genetic risk factors but I had all environmental factors. Right. That trauma really uh, knocked me for a loop. Yeah. And um, I developed an addiction, a full-blown addiction uh, as a result that lasted from age 14. It, be it began, you know, yep. around 14 and lasted um, un actually until I, I was 37 years old. Yep. So that, that really, you know, if we talk about my life, we have to talk about that yes, because absolutely. it shaped my life uh, in a way that I was, I had no choice. I was powerless over it. So that's a good 20 some years, 23 years. 23 I, years. What, what, was, what was the pivotal, what changed things though? At, at 37, something happened. Well, <clears throat> You know, I, I like to I like to think, Gary, that that inside me, in my inner world, that there has always been I I like metaphors. I would just call it a flame. There's always been a flame. And it started in childhood to do good, to be good. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it was never extinguished. Mm -hmm. Even throughout the addiction, it was never extinguished. And um, it was almost extinguished, yeah. but it, it was fully extinguished. Yeah. Um, for instance, when I, 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 I was sentenced, I went to prison in Massachusetts and uh, for drug-related offenses. 
And in prison, I motivated to, to, to get my GED. That little flame told me there's something in here yeah. for you. I got my GED. Mm -hmm. I later on went to Fordham University mm -hmm. and it was that GED that got me in. Mm -hmm. um, I um, decided to be a master's level social worker uh, because I had been in therapy uh, with one of my mentors, Millie Klingman. Um, Millie, I was in therapy with Millie for seven years mm. uh, toward the, 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 the end of my uh, addiction. And um, she was a social worker and she appealed to that little flame. She resonated with me and I decided mm. that I, you know, I, this would be my way to do good. I would be a social worker. Yeah. And I got an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in social work. I was a fellow at um, Columbia University. <clears throat> but I was still in the grips of the disease. At that point, I wasn't using um, uh, opioids or stimulants or, or, or drugs of that. I wasn't injecting drugs any longer. But I was drinking. And mm -hmm. um, even, even, even while that was developing this last phase of alcoholism, which I finally ended in, in, in uh, 1984 at the age of 37, that little flame was kind of driving me. I was doing my best with it. Mm. So I, I achieved uh, uh, degrees in social work. <clears throat> mm. in, in 1984, I can just tell you this, that... Um, I was at an all-time low emotionally, and I ran into a group of people who there was no stigma. They saw me for who I was. They loved me and understood me and supported me because I, I was a person with addiction, mm. because I was a person with alcoholism. Mm. They embraced me. and. Um, they saved my life. It was mm. Vermonters in 1984 that literally saved my life. Mm. And since that point, there's a demarcation in my life. And it's July yeah. 22nd, 1984. Yep. Boom. That yep. was when literally, and I'm, I was 37 years old and I'm 74 now. It was exactly yep. at the halfway point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that unconditional love that you got from a group of people for just embracing you for who you were and are, it almost, uh, it allowed you to recapture that youthful Eddie who wanted to do good in the world and bring it right up to the 37th birthday so, and moving forward. Exactly, exactly. And they became, uh, you know, the father I never had or the father that I lost, I had, because yep. I had one, the father I yep. lost, the mother, the siblings, the family, they became yep. everything to me. And, yep. um, and they, I began to live there again. And uh, it's been, it's been an, a wonderful journey. Mm. Uh, we can literally say my life is, is definitely half full, if not mm. more, you know, the empty part is, is over and behind me. Mm. And and more so, more so than that. And I'll get into that a little bit later about what it, what it means to have that uh, behind me. It's a very mm -hmm. very complicated story, and I don't mean to to say too much or wind around too much. But this no. is my life. It was yeah, complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I, the image I has is that that flame was on a like a pilot light, and now it's and it just blew up. It just it's big flame. <laughs> And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Today, are there, today, are there, today is, yeah. Have you had some mentors along the road, pre-37, post-37, that really made things different for you in a good way? It was, it was a pre, it was Millie Klingman was the psychotherapist. And there's a picture yeah. that I have of her. She's at my graduation and we're both full of joy. She really was my, um, my my one of my main mentors, she saved me. I, I can remember I went to my first session with Millie and I was such a mess that she said, you know, we were in her therapy room. And she said, you know, I'm gonna end the session now. Why don't you come in here with me? 
she took me in her kitchen. She lived in the Thorpe, a beautiful, one of those uh, buildings on the uh, west, upper west side of Manhattan, like the Dakota. Yep. She, was, she was wonderful. She said, you know, what, just come with me. And she took me in her kitchen and she, she gave me chicken soup and saltines and just mm. fed me because, I mean, she just, <laughs> she, she just loved me. What can, uh, what can I say? Yeah, and I yeah, yeah. Up for seven years, and um, you know, she'll always, she'll always be very, very wow. special to me. I became a social worker because of Millie Klingman. Wow. Now, in my in my recovery, I've had um, mainly men, four or five men who have over the years um, sponsored me and been spiritual. Uh, advisors to me and confidants to me who have really gotten to know me uh, mm -hmm. intimate and, and thoroughly. And uh, I, 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 some of them, some of them have passed away. Some of them I'm still friends with and they're my oldest friends. Yeah. And um, they just uh, taught me, I, I think, how to be honest, how to uh, strive to live a spiritual life and, you know, stay on a spiritual course and, and, and realize what's really important in life and not get distracted and not, not, uh, you know, it's so easy for someone with addiction to begin to forget and move backwards. And, and these, these mentors have made sure that that I am well equipped uh, to not move uh, backwards. Mm. Uh, I, I like to I like to think um, for me that each each moment is uh, a point of no return. I, I like to look at life as uh, a continual uh, moving forward. I look at each moment as a point of no return, and um, I believe deeply in in preparation. That that life prepares me, life prepares you. you. You may not know what for, but but it's prepared you. And if you're sensitive to it, um, you'll you'll be prepared for whatever the moment uh, brings you. And mm. uh, it's like addiction prepares you for recovery. And recovery prepares you for helping others. You know, it just, it, I just have that, they taught me that. Mm -hmm. That. I get the sense that you've been paying their counsel to you forward with many, many other people. I like to, you know, you know, that that really has been my life, Gary, mm -hmm. for, for a very long time. Uh, to be a helper, to do good, to try to have empathy, compassion, um, to try to to try to listen. You know, I spent over 30 years listening to people to try to listen to and understand them and then, um, you know, offer, offer whatever kind of support I have or, or they need. I, I, I like to, um, I call it the alchemy, alchemy uh, of the meaning that, that if you look up alchemists in the dictionary, alchemists were sort of, you know, uh, chemical wizards, you know, they, they were always striving to turn lead into gold, to do magic. And um, I think meaning does that. You know, we, we cannot change the past. We cannot reach back into the past and change it. But when we change the meaning of it, yeah. the leaden past becomes gold. Mm -hmm. And there's also like a redemptive power in helping people with it. When you can help someone with your past, mm. no matter how tragic it was, no matter how terrible some of the things you did were, yeah. when you can tell them, I understand you, I've been where you are, I yeah. know, yeah. they're no longer alone. So by, by infusing the past with meaning, you actually reach into it, and you get just about as close to changing it as you can. Mm. And you help somebody with it. So that's been 
the guiding force of my life uh, for a long time. That's been the guiding force of my life. Wow. Well said, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. have a family. You have some children. You're married, happily I do. married. How I do. So how has all of this helped you be the father that you are and the husband that you are? Oh, what a great question. You know, my 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 lovely wife, Ellen, um, <clears throat> the sweetest wife you could ever imagine. She's so sweet, I call her sweetie. My <laughs> lovely wife, my lovely wife, sweetie. Um, <clears throat> you know, she's she's irresistible, Gary. And um, she's like managed to sort of bring the love out of me. She's irresistible. I love her. Um, along with that came, you know, growing and learning and being uh, a good husband. That 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 these things are in us, but but you know, we don't know it until they're brought out. She's brought this out in me, my own ability to to love her uh, more and more every day, really. That's great. And, and, and my own ability to be a good husband. And I would tell you that that um, she's just wonderful. And I, I would tell you that that my boys, uh, Jed and Josie, um, and and my grandson, uh, Cassidy, mm -hmm. and my, um, my my daughter-in-law, um, Kathy, my boys in particular have, and I had a lot of fear about being a father because of what happened to me. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of fear about it, but 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 somehow because I, I was in recovery, I, I got into recovery when they were uh, two and one years old. Thank goodness, mm -hmm. I allowed them to do the same thing, or I allowed myself to 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 learn how to be a father to them, and I have been a good father mm -hmm. to them. For their entire lives. That's great. And and we're close today. We're so close today. Um, there's such a joy. I, I really uh, I can't even. It's hard to put into words how 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 much I love them and how much a joy it is uh, to be with them. We do a lot of things together. Uh, we're in in contact all the time. You know how it is. People live all over the place now, but yeah. Yeah. um, there we'll be seeing them this summer. Um. Uh, Jed will be getting uh, married. My my oldest son Jed will be getting married next year. Josie has um, and Kathy have uh, one boy. My grandson Cassidy, mm -hmm. who in there we have a, a beautiful picture of Cassidy to put up too. Oh, and yes. uh, the joy of being a, a grandfather mm. is just something that for for many years I didn't think this would ever happen. When I was in that dark place, yeah. Sure. No, I did not think these things would happen. <clears throat> I have to ask you a question. Have you gone kite flying with your boys? Yes, yes, yes. And um, and Josie has gone with with uh, Cassidy too. Yes. Nice. Yes, for sure. Nice. And we nice. will again. <clears throat> Good. <clears throat> um, so there's, you know, in many ways, um, your life's work is who you are. Um, you're giving a lot to people all the time, uh, receiving mm -hmm. a lot from other people. Do you have any advocations, things that you do for just for you, things that are fun well, for you to do? Let me let me talk about life's work again for one minute because yeah, I, I think I think this is important. I was uh, listening to um, an author yesterday. Um, I don't have his name with me, but he was uh, speaking about white supremacy and um, eloquently, eloquently talking about, you know, the black experience in America. <clears throat> and he, he used a phrase that I had never really heard before, but it, it really put something in perspective for me. He used the phrase communal grief. And he talked about how, um, Black Africans, descendants of enslaved Africans, yeah. you know, um, must 
experience this communal grief of the Absolutely. things that have happened to them over the past 400 years. Yep. And um, I heard that and I thought that it really explained a lot to me because in, in 2015, um, that this number, 28,647, there were 28,647 overdose fatalities in 2014. Yeah. I learned about that in 2015. And Gary, I, though these are my people, mm -hmm. people with addictions, right. I, I experienced communal grief. Mm. I kid you not. Yes. I didn't know what it was when I experienced it, and I don't talk about it, but it was a tsunami, an overwhelming, frightening tsunami right. of grief yep. um, for those who were taken by addiction, yes. for those who had no choice. Yes. And and that that moment, or 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 you know, I, like I say, things, everything is preparation. I had been prepared for it, but mm -hmm. that moment really set in my heart and in my soul, the, the focus of my work to eliminate the stigma mm. wrongly placed on people with substance use disorder. Mm. It became like a, a burning uh, singular you know, focus. And, and, and um, the ARC show, the Addiction Recovery Channel, yep. and a lot of the uh, public uh, speaking engagements that I'll do, Yep. are all focused on that mm. because for some reason i experienced communal grief and it wasn't it was a gift gary it wasn't something that i said okay now i'm going to do this it happened it right. happened right um and that's actually as a uh euro-american that, that's not something that people who are of the same color you and i are experience so much you know i think yeah. of native americans african americans uh, yeah. many people experience that communal grief and with no outlet to help heal that in many ways yeah yeah and you know this particular author i wish i could find his name resma there it is resma resma monacum resma monacum he wrote my grandmother's hands you know, he talks about, you know, like for white people, um, the need to experience that communal grief also yep. that, that that black people will, will need to experience. But he, he talked about like for a white person, we have to kind of excavate. We have to get down in there and remove things that are blocking it. Get down in there and like, you know, really reflect on who we are and that you know, this whole idea of white and black yeah. is a fake social yeah. political construction That's right. that that they're us and we're them, we're, we're, we're we. Right. And that communal grief is our communal grief too. Yeah. And when we That's experience right. it, and only when we experience it, then we can begin to move on to mm. something new, a new structure mm. for our culture. Mm. So so this is something that 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 Eddie, me, yeah. I want to do this, and um, I, I, I don't think it's going to be easy because of the the layers, you know, that we've learned that are, that are covering it. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would like to think that I'm committed at this point uh, to yeah. moving forward, in, in some clumsy way, yeah. you know, to 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 accomplish that at some point. That's yeah. fantastic, and. I, you know, in, in the recovery community, in a sense, may have a lens into this that others don't. But I think I like your idea that we are all, there is no division between white and black and Native American, that we, one's grief is all of ours grief. And how do we yeah. get that together so that we can all heal together? Yeah, yeah. And when you begin to look at it and begin to read books, uh, there's another book, um, White Privilege, that that is very, uh, in some sense, it's easy reading, but in some sense, it's very difficult reading. And then there's another one, um, How to Be an Anti, 
racist. There's a, a few publications around that that I, I just, I, I'm reading them. Mm -hmm. I'm reading them. This is kind of an avenue that I'm going to be mm -hmm. headed toward. And when you look at it, Gary, I mean, you know, you're kind of around the same age as me. We, we've seen, uh, we've seen things like, like what's happening today in America. We've seen the 60s. You know, we've seen voting rights and civil rights and Martin Luther King right. Jr. Right. We, we've seen this. We've seen starts to this, and then we've seen, we've seen everything fall apart. People get yep. complacent, not enough, and back to business as usual. Yep. So this is another time when this is in our face, and uh, it's our opportunity to, I think, and this is about my life. I mean, I, this mm -hmm. is this is what makes me me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I I do believe that um, for me, it's morally compelling. It is morally compelling and, and it must be done. I have to do it. I have to yeah. come to grips with this and do something about it. Morally compelling. It's not politically correct. It's not politically expedient. It's not emotionally expedient. It's morally compelling. It goes down deep. It's right at the core of who you are and what you want to do with your life. Sounds like it is. It. Yep. It is. Good for you. Anything about your life to date you want to share around wisdom learned, uh, a nugget of, of uh, from an experience that can help others in the audience grow and learn from? That's an interesting um, question. You know, <clears throat> I, 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 I do, I do believe I've, I've alluded to it before, and. Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll go into it a little bit, and then and then I want to tell you about having fun. But you know, I, I do believe it's not like a nugget of anything. Um, but but I do I do believe that everything is preparation. Mm -hmm. I I think that everything is preparation. I think that that you know we, you know maybe it has to do with age. You know, maybe maybe my 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 wisdom it can only be accepted by old people. I don't know. It seems kind of difficult if you're young, but but I do believe that everything is preparation. And um, so in other words, little, uh, hmm? in other words, everything in your life to this point has helped prepare you to be who you are today. I do. There's, believe, no, I there's do. no bad experience. It's an experience that you grow and learn from. I do believe that. I, I I do believe that, and then and al along with along with that, we have a responsibility to to um, like kind of cultivate like an inner sensitivity toward you know like whatever the next experience is that we're being prepared to face. Mm -hmm. So we're prepared. But but we have to also be aware of here this this coming at me now is what I'm being prepared for. Right. You can miss opportunities yeah. to do things that are meaningful, even though you've been prepared for them, if you're not aware of the opportunity. And that's really only two of the three ingredients. The next ingredient is free will. So you're prepared, okay. You're sensitive, okay. You're aware now of the opportunity. But that third part, that third part. Now, when you exercise free will, is it going to be to accept the responsibility of responding to that opportunity you've been prepared for? Mm -hmm. that, that's That's crucial. And I think that's, essential to understand that mm -hmm. about ourselves as we face life that mm -hmm. is always coming at us mm -hmm. you know uh, we we have we have that 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 free will and and that really kind of um kind of burrows down into who you are and how you want to perceive yourself and and live your life and um you know i i, I guess that's one of the things that I that I think about a lot. I'm, I'm a thinker. I think about these things, 
you know, uh, pretty often. And um, mm -hmm. that's something that I, I guess is becoming clearer to me as, mm -hmm. as I move along. And um, it's, it's beautiful. You know, it's just beautiful. And, yeah. you know, if you, if you, if you can adhere to something that is going to bring you to your best self in life, Mm -hmm. then then what what is really an, an improvement on that really mm -hmm. i mean that's a that's a beautiful thing to to understand that we all have that yeah we all have that. i get the sense too that uh, when faced with that free will for you a lot of times it's take action do something that you know <laughs> we, you you have the freedom to say i understand it it's there i'm not going to do anything about it but that's not eddie baker it, it it is you know it, it is in in certain areas you know i feel like i have um competence and and something of 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 merit to offer and mm -hmm. um and that that and i try to stick with that you know i i just try to try to stick with that i also um you know i i guess at at this point i do get I get a lot out of doing something for nothing. I don't know how to say that. I just, I get a lot out of, I get a great spirit. I, I become more spiritually prosperous when, when, I, when I do something mm. just to do it. Mm. Just to do it. I'm doing it yeah. to do it. And the yeah. reward is in doing it. And that, yeah. that's, that's, that's new. That, that wasn't always that way. That, yeah. that's, that's something new. And I guess that's what I mean. That's one yeah. of that, you know, I've been prepared for it. The opportunity is here. And um, my free will is saying yes. That's a yes. good example, of that, actually. Yeah. That's yeah. great. That's great. All right. So what are those things that you love to do for Eddie Baker? <laughs> <laughs> my wife and I, my wife and I have spent quite a bit of time dancing. <clears throat> we, we were, uh, we, you know, we, we don't go that much anymore, but you know, years of our marriage was spent uh, dancing uh, West Coast Swing, a very funky dance. Oh, you know, nice. Loopy dance, you know, we would go to events and clubs and honky tonks and, you know, dance till early in the morning. And uh, wow. it's, yeah, it's just one of the fondest memories of my my life. My mom and dad were dancers. They met at Roseland. That's and, right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and my sweetie and I, I tell you, we, we, we were pretty good dancers and we still are, but we just don't go that much anymore. <clears throat> there was so much, so much. I mean, talking about driving to Boston, flying to Georgia, wow. you know, driving to uh, Connecticut, New York, you know, I mean, all over Vermont. I mean, we used to go dancing all the time. We were just dancers. What, so competitive? Much. Did you, was this competitive dancing? We, 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 we competed, but not on a professional level. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes. We we um we competed. We we got first place once in a in a competition, and then we got second place once. Wow! In and then third place a couple of times. Wow. Uh, so we we were pretty accomplished West Coast swingers. We had a a, 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 a great time. That's a really fantastic. Time. In fact, the inside of our our wedding ring, the inscription on the inside of our wedding ring is uh, "Their hearts are dancing." Oh, so, isn't that you know, wow? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And of course, my 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 children are, are 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 one of my my treasures in life, one of my joys in life, and uh, you know nothing nothing beats that. Doing things with them, mm -hmm. traveling with them, you know, mountain biking, uh, you know, eating, being together, you know, telling stories, laughing. We uh, that's always been a a beautiful treasure, and always always will be. Um, my one of my not one of my my main number one hobby is mountain biking i i could be considered a, an avid an avid mountain biker i love wow. mountain biking wow nice yeah and where did you pick that up where, how did that happen that happened about seven years ago i think my son josie took me out on a trail and um Something happened. I just liked it and started biking. And I, I didn't even have a mountain bike and I would do it anyway. I got a little more interested in it. And I got a bike. I got better at it. It's one of those skills where, I mean, it has everything. It's mm. out there in nature. 
It's gorgeous. I mean, there are spiritual moments out there. You clear your mind out and you let things in. Beautiful mm. thoughts, beautiful mm. feelings. Uh, you're, you're in touch with the here and now. You have to pay attention to the here and now when you're mountain biking or you right. could get really hurt. So yes. you kind of manage to sort of be here now. Mm-hmm. And um, plus it's, it's great for your heart. It's great for your body. It, you know, if you go enough, you can eat whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want and stay <laughs> trim if you mountain bike. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, plus, if you like gadgets and like, you know, high quality things, mm-hmm. you know, mountain bikes, there there really is no limit to what can happen with a mountain bike. I mean, right. it's really a big deal. So it's right. one of the it's one of my it's one of my favorite things. That's wonderful. Favorite- That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Now I cook. I've been learning to cook. I've, I cook a lot, actually. I cook dinner a lot for my wife and I. I um I enjoy that tremendously. It's a really nice time we have like almost every night. Mm. You know, we, we sit down, we make special time, we have a nice dinner together every night. That's and, wonderful. Um, it's it's beautiful. That's and a wonderful. lot of them are cooked. Yeah. And did you get pick up some of that cooking from your mom? I, well, yeah, you know, I think it's probably, you know, like kind of like an environmental, I love it. You know, yeah. and um my mom, probably genetic too. My mom. She, she, Gary, she would make spreads, you know, pasta, meatballs, sausages, uh, bread, you know, vegetables, dessert, Mm. all kinds of eggplant, parmesan, lasagna, all kinds of stuff. She'd make a lot of it. Mm. My job back then was I had the um, uh, parmesan cheese with the grater. Oh, yeah, the grater. I would have to to grate up a big mountain of parmesan (laughs) cheese before everybody came over. And then exactly. she, would, she would have this huge pot on the stove simmering all day. And she'd be spooning off whatever fat rose to the top, spooning it off. And there'd wow. be meatballs in there and sausage in there, this tomato sauce. Yeah. And um, part of what my, part of my uh, reward for grating the Parmesan cheese was I would get a, a, like a, a nice thick slice of freshly baked bread with that mm. sauce ladled mm. on top of it before wow. we ate. Wow. So that was my, my thing. <laughs> yeah. So if I got cooking from anybody, it's definitely from her. She was, she was, she was something. Yeah. That's wonderful. My goodness. Yeah. yeah. A rich life. And yeah. uh, you and Alan like to travel. We like to travel. You know, we've been to uh, Thailand, we've been to Mexico, or we've been to. Um, Italy. We spent quite a while in Italy. Mm. We had a trip uh, last year scheduled for our 25th uh, wedding anniversary. We were going to hit. We were going to Italy for a couple of weeks, and then over to uh, Greece wow. for our 25th anniversary. You know, it's a big deal. Yeah. And we, you know, because of COVID, we had to uh, cancel it. Sorry. And then we had planned. We would be there right now. We had planned to go now or next week, oh. but it just—it's still not right. No. So, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, next year but one that we know we'll go on um like local vacations and Mm -hmm. one of one of the things i mean being somewhere beautiful and having breakfast made and all that is is a lot of fun but but really the one of the main things you know independent of where we go is this idea of really paying absolute attention to each other Mm -hmm. and um you know no no work no business no distraction yep. Yep. it's all about you and me and yep. we really get to um to really give each other the kind of, of attention that we like to quality give each other. time together yep. yeah 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 you don't have to travel very far to do that if you unplug yourself from all the stuff that goes on in the world yeah 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 good for you good for you well eddie we're Getting close to the end of the interview, is there anything you'd like to share? Think of this great life that you've led to date. Share pearls of wisdom, parting thoughts. Anything you want to wrap this up in a in a way for the audience and for you? Well, 
Hmm. And for you? Well, I guess, I guess uh, you know, I've talked a lot. And uh, thank you for, for being interested in me. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate that, Gary. And I hope that, um, I hope that the, the viewers, you know, found some merit in, in, in my, my sharing my sure life. Did. You know, I'm a. I think I'm a firm believer in um, a beauty and meaning being in the eye and soul of the beholder. So I'm. I'm not going to close with, you know, something that, you know, wants to summarize or I want people to remember. Yep. Yeah. I just hope that 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 I gave. I gave. I hope I gave the audience. I hope I gave the audience something. Well, I yeah. From my perspective, you gave the audience a lot, Eddie Baker. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. It's been wonderful to have you on my first show. And <laughs> you, you set a high bar for future guests. So well, thank you. you know, just one, just yeah. in closing, I'd like to think that I've inspired you a little bit with my yeah. show. I'd like to think that. Absolutely. And then I, I want I want to pay I want to pay homage to um uh to Margaret Harrington, also of our, our, our fearless little station here. Margaret had her own show. And Margaret invited me on to talk about the um, overdose mm. uh, crisis a number of years ago. I think it was four mm. years ago. Mm. And I was flattered to be on her show. Mm. I went on her show and I talked about the overdose crisis and she interviewed me. And after the show, Gary, she said, hey, Ed, you know, I think maybe you could have your own show. <laughs> and I had never ever is that the right thought had never ever crossed my mind in a million years Interesting. but it was having been prepared for it prepared yes sensitive to it and exactly. then my will saying yes to it so yes I, I see that in you Gary mm -hmm. I see that in you you know it's the same exact process I see it yes. in you absolutely Thank you. And I have one last question for you. You grew up in the Bronx. Did you go to Yankee Stadium? I did. I know where Yankee Stadium is. I, I, okay. Of course. Are you a Yankee yeah. fan? No. Oh my no. goodness. Who do you think? Who do you think? Who do you think we my family was fans of? We are not the Yankees. The Mets. Willie Mays. Willie Mays. Oh, okay. Giants. Oh, the Giants. Oh yeah. my goodness. We, yes. we, 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 we were we were Giants fans. We just was the way the way it was. You know how it is, like in in your apartment. Like we're Giants fans. We're watching the Giants. <laughs> fans. That's the way that's that's the way it was. Giant fans yeah. all the way. 100 <laughs> percent right. the Yankees Ellen, Ellen's the Yankee fan. Good for yeah. her. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you so much, Eddie Baker. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you, Gary. Thank you All so right. much. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye.